and call this uh, part three of uh, learning obedience. You know, it's important to see the the state of mind that that Paul was trying to describe to be able to walk in the liberty that is in Christ that that freed us from the law because as he he describes in first Corinthians fifteen fifty six that the sting of death is sin, but the strength of sin is the law. And in Romans seven four he says consider yourselves dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another even to him who is risen from the dead and and in verse 6 he's saying having died to what held us talking about the law having died to the law that held us prisoners to sin as in in, in regards to the mind because in verse 23 of chapter 7 he says I see another law other than the law of, of God given to Israel by Moses he says in, in my flesh in my members waging war against the law of my mind he says and bringing it into captivity to the law of sin that's in my flesh so, and in verse uh, 2 of chapter 8 he says for the law of life that is in Christ Jesus or in the spirit of Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. And as he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, that the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, but the last man, Adam, was made a, a life-giving spirit. You know, so it is, it's, it's important to see the, the attitude that Paul is describing in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 and 10, 23, you know, saying all things are lawful for me. And we gotta understand what he's talking about. He's talking about a state of mind that, you know, we're dead to the law, that removes sin's strength. But in in uh, Romans three thirty one, he says, do we void the law through faith? God forbid or certainly not, yea, we establish it. And we need to understand, uh, I mean, we need to understand that to be able to walk in that liberty that is in Christ. As he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 7, for some are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, the full discernment of the truth, as the Greek word translated knowledge actually means to, to fully discern, to fully understand, to because uh, as we need to see that the law was a shadow or a figure until Christ should come. We need to understand. We need to understand that concerning the law. He says in Romans 3.20, no, no flesh shall be justified or made righteous by the works of the law, for by the law is the knowledge that that full that Greek word full discernment again same Greek word as used when uh, Paul speaks of the knowledge of the truth the full discernment of the truth and Jesus is the way the truth and the life John fourteen six so we need to understand we need to understand this to come to a revelation of it because he says in uh, Romans two twenty for talking about the Jews in the law in reference to the law have a form of the knowledge and of the truth and then that Greek word that word knowledge again that full discernment and we need to understand how that that relates to Christ uh, for for us to come to that full discernment for that that understanding of of what it is that he accomplished in freeing us from the law the sin strength as he says in Romans six fourteen, for sin shall have no dominion over you for you're not under the law but under grace and you know people have uh, distorted that and just made it as 
if you sin, it's okay. And that is not what he's talking about. He's talking about having been, been freed from sin's strength, sin's dominion. Because as he says in uh, Romans 6, 7, the one who's dead is freed from sin, justified, made righteous from sin. As, uh, as he also says in verse 18 of chapter 6, he says, having then been freed from sin, we became the slaves of righteousness. You know, so we need to understand that. You know, and I think it's so important for us to see the humanity of Jesus because people don't have a problem with acknowledging him as the word made flesh and as as Paul describes you know without controversy great is the mystery of godliness for God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit seen of angels because no one has ever seen God before and received up into glory. I mean, but we also need to see his humanity and the writer of Hebrews really points out his humanity. You know, as, as he says that who in the days of his flesh offered up strong prayers, fervent prayers with cryings. Here, let me uh, He says, who in the days of his flesh, and this is Young's literal translation, who in the days of his flesh, both prayers and supplications unto him who was able to save him from death with strong cryings and tears. You know, as is in, in one of the gospels, he says that he, he sweated as it were great droplets of blood. And uh, scientifically, that is proven to be a, a possibility when someone is under great stress. And as he said, you know, you know, uh, on the eve of his crucifixion, that he was troubled unto the death and uh, sorrowful. I mean, so we need to we need to be able to see because God, it, it, you know, Paul Paul describes. Uh, that in in Philippians, I believe it's chapter two, you know, Christ who existing before in the form of God, the Spirit God, as as Jesus describes God in in John chapter four to the woman at the well, that the hour comes and now is that the true worshipers of God shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship God, for God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth because this is what God desires you know and uh, he says and though he through being a son didn't learn the things which he suffered the obedience, having learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. And we, and I've already connected that with Philippians chapter 3, where Paul is saying, I don't count myself to have attained, neither were already made perfect. You know, and he's talking about in regards to the resurrection where Jesus was made perfect, uh, who was without sin. We need to understand that what Paul was talking about 
in the same sense, he was not talking about growing out of sin. You know, when people get hung up on that, you know, you, we can't justify ourselves or try to make ourselves feel better. <laughs> you know, with with that lie that well, no one's perfect, and they just use that as an excuse but we need to see the humanity of Jesus and and they because the only way that we're going to bring the reality of truth and light to us that what Christ done for us is seeing that the only thing different about him was that he was the la uh, second man, the last Adam, as Paul describes him in 1 Corinthians 15. You know, he was born apart from the, the sin that Adam sowed into the flesh of all. Because he describes that in Romans seven fourteen, for we are carnal or fleshly sold under sin. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he, he describes the first man being made. He said, how be it that which was spiritual was not first, but that which was natural, and then that which was spiritual. You know, and, and the modern faith movement has distorted that. And all it is, it is doing is hindering us from seeing the truth that is in Christ and what he accomplished for us so that we can walk in the liberty from sin that is in him because we need to understand that it is faith that we live by, faith that we are justified by. And if we don't have a, 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 a correct discernment and understanding of the scripture in regard to Jesus, in regard to what he done for us and who we are in him, we cannot walk in that liberty that he purchased for us. You know, and, and the writer of Hebrews describes that when he's talking about the Old Testament sacrifices were never able to take away sin. Let me go there. Um... <coughs> And, you know, let me go to 9 first, he says, because, uh, he says, uh, well, he's talking about chapter 9, start at verse 1, then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a and a worldly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, the Holy of Holies, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. He says, which was a figure. This is what I was talking about before in some of the writings of Paul 
in the, his letter to the Roman uh, assembly, he says, which was a figure for the time then present in which we were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Okay, well, going over here into chapter 10, he says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, the image, the figure, the, the type that he said in Romans 2.20 for, you know, talking about the law, the law and the Jews, he says, have a form of the knowledge and of the truth that is as in Christ is seen uh, when when God spoke to Moses, when he was commanded him how to build everything, he showed him a pattern in the mount. God said, see to it, you make everything after the pattern which I showed you in the mount. So, I mean, this is really is significant in understanding all of this, uh, bringing all of these parts together for the law having a shadow of the things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect in regard to the conscience like we just read in chapter 9 which is why I went back to chapter 9 to, sh to show that to, to give a testimony to that for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin, no more remembrance. He says, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. And this is really important because now he's getting ready to talk about the sacrifice of Christ. He says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. For when he comes into the world, talking about Christ, he says, sacrifice and offering you would not, will not, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, he's talking about Christ, come in the, in, in the volume, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Above when he says sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings for sin you would, you would not, you did not desire, neither had pleasure then, therein, which were offered by the law. Then said he, talking about Christ, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. And, I mean, we need to understand that even as the Apostle Paul in his first letter talks about having Jesus coming to take away our sin, to put away sin, and even as the writer of Hebrews here in the the latter part he says when Christ shall return it is going to be without sin to judge so he came the first time and as Peter as Peter said let me let me go there first Peter first Peter 2 24 he says who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. And that is talking about healed from the wound of sin. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That Greek word salvation means deliverance and healing. And he's talking about from the wound of sin, you know. And, and it doesn't exclude physical healing from diseases, whatever, because those things came because of transgressions. You know, uh, he came to redeem us out from the, under the curse of the law. You know, and, and, and 
just because you get a sickness doesn't necessarily mean you sin, even as James said, you know, is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and the prayer of faith shall, shall save him or raise him up, you know, so, and if he has been, and if he has committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. So, I mean, he says, um, Because it's... He says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, a true heart and full assurance of faith in what Christ accomplished for us. That's why he went through this to describe what it was that Christ came to take away our sin, to take away our conscience of sin. As he, as he says in uh, uh, Hebrews 9, 13, and 14, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the sprinkling of the ashes in, uh, of, a, of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Jesus, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, talking about spot of the flesh, purge your minds from evil works. And uh, so this, I mean, this is just important in putting all of these things together because the only way that we can walk in it is if we have faith in it. You know, because we're justified by faith. Oh, as he says in, in Romans one seventeen, for the righteousness of God is revealed in the in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, I'm crucified, you know, uh, from faith unto faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, what's where is not a faith of sin, Romans fourteen twenty three. Uh, as James puts it in 4.17, that the one who knows the good to do and does it not to him, it is sin. That's what, you know, Paul was talking about, you know, um, guarding the conscience, you know, not doing anything outside of our faith, you know, and those that are strong in the faith shouldn't be encouraging someone weak in the faith to do something outside of their faith. You know, and and wound their conscience. He he says in First Corinthians concerning meats offered to idols, he's like, you know, destroy your brother for meat. You know, talking about walking charitably. You know, if 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 you have faith in God and you're not eating a meat that's been offered to an idol with conscience of the idol but you give thanks to God he says but what about the one who sees you eat knowing you're eating something offered to an idol and this is just this is just an example to give kind of context to to bearing the infirmities of those weak in the faith not doing something that's going to embolden someone who's weak in the faith to do something outside of their faith. He says, because we need to understand that once, you know, once you've been purged, I mean, if, if you violate your conscience, you may never recover. And he's talking about the to the defiled and the unbelieving, two separate categories of people. In, in Titus 1.15, to the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. I mean, that's why you got people walking around and they, they, they can't even go to doctors. I've seen, I've seen one man at a job, that a, a company that I worked for, and. He had he had gotten into a wreck and his head went into the windshield, and his his scalp was peeled back, and his family 
they their faith wouldn't allow them to go to a doctor even though they're doing all the things that a doctor would do except for you know a hospital has more sanitary conditions and they have a way of helping keep it from getting infected with an accident like that I mean Paul calls Luke the blood physician you know and and so you know um, and we gotta guard our conscience because what if if we defile it I mean what happens is that that people get bound they get bound up and nothing nothing is pure and you know Paul may have he's he's not just talking about foods now he's not just talking about foods and wine you know he's he, he's talking about something more far reaching and and the writer of Hebrews he says um Having a high priest over the house of God, verse 21 of chapter 10 of Hebrews, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith in what he accomplished for us, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, talking about baptism into water. He says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love unto good works, not for not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, and that is what uh, Paul wrote to Timothy about in 2 Timothy 3, 7, some are ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, I mean, we need to understand that, you know, and if we sin willfully after, and we need to understand willfully, I mean, first of all, once you've come to the knowledge of the truth, to sin willfully, that means to sin knowingly. To know something, as James said, to know, to know it is wrong and do it anyway. You know, but, you, but we're talking about those who have come to the knowledge of the truth. Once you've come to the knowledge of the truth, and you know, it's so important not to exalt ourselves, to think that we're something that we're not because if we haven't come to that place of maturity that we've learned to do that to walk in that then we're, we're just creating a stumbling block for ourselves so I mean so and, and this is where faith faith in the Word of God understanding discernment you know coming to an accurate understanding of what is written and not just ignoring what is hard to understand because as James said any of you lack wisdom let him let him ask of God who gives to everyone liberally without upbraiding you know as and and my my walk with God Proverbs uh, three five was always one of uh, that I clung to. You know, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And faith comes by hearing, but hearing. For faith comes by the word of God. And, you know, 
And there are a lot of people out there speaking things that are not the word of God. They're speaking lies. So prove all things. You don't have to receive everything everyone says. Prove what I say. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying in all these videos not to say anything that I don't have scripture for and that there is not at least two scripture bearing witness to those things. Because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. You know, Satan is the master of taking one verse and twisting it and perverting it. You know, even as Peter spoke of those who take Paul's writings and twist them as they do the rest of the scripture to their own hurt. You know, so prove all things. You know, someone comes, don't, don't, be, don't be condemned by what someone else says. You know, come, come to a, a true understanding of what the Word of God says. You know, proving all things. You know, there are a lot of people out there speaking what God has not sent them to speak. As he, as he says in Romans 10, you know, how should they believe on whom they have not heard? And how should they heard and hear unless someone herald the message? And how shall they herald the message unless they be sent? There are a lot of people sending themselves with a message that God did not give. You know, and I'm, I'm going to end it on that. And... Uh, You know, let us stand there for having on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand in the evil day. You know, the breastplate of righteousness held in place with the girdle of truth, the helmet of salvation, a renewed mind in the spirit, being renewed in the spirit of our mind by the word of the truth of God's word, putting on the new man who after God has created righteousness, the holiness of the truth, and our feet shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace. You know, let us stand therefore in the truth that is in Christ. Let us see what he actually accomplished for us.